<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm Manish Agrawala. I am the director of the Brown Institute uh, here at Stanford. How many of you know what the Brown Institute is? Okay, it looks like everyone. Good, so I, I won't have to do the regular introduction. Um, for those of you who haven't been to this space, uh, this is the new Brown space in Gates Computer Science. Uh, we've been here about a year, and this is one of the first presentations where we've finally gotten to open these big doors and let in the fresh air. So uh, you're inaugurating the space in, in some sense. Um, so uh, we like to bring in speakers from time to time over the, over the year to tell us a little bit about what's going on in media and journalism. And uh, today I am very excited because we have Jay Rosen here. He is a professor of journalism at NYU. Uh, he's been there since 1986, uh, and uh, he was chair of the department from 99 to 2005 or so. Um, he has also served on the boards of many different uh, media and journalism related organizations, including the Wikimedia Board of Advisors. Um, and uh, you might also know about him from his blog. He started Press Think. Uh, and it's uh, one of the best laws, in my opinion, to uh, uh, report on the practice of journalism and some of the issues surrounding journalism. Uh, and I recently saw an article from Jay talking about transparency in journalism. Uh, and if you haven't seen that uh, article, I really encourage you to check it out. It's a fantastic write-up about how journalists should be thinking about transparency. And uh, I'm really glad that we have him out here today because he's going to tell us about some of these thoughts, in, partic in particular in the relationship between trust and transparency in journalism. So, welcome, Jim. Thank you, Manish and Anne, for uh, inviting me to Stanford today. I come in peace. Um, we work on the same subjects, innovation in media and, and journalism. I run a small graduate program at NYU that is focused on innovation in journalism. And even though I'm not a tech person myself, I'm more of a user of technology, I try to run my own uh, innovation projects in journalism. Right now I'm doing something with Beat Reporters, which I'll tell you about <coughs> if you want to ask me, called Join the Beat, which I'm very excited about. Um, now that gets to the title of tonight's talk, which came out a little bit differently, welcome, on the flyer than I had proposed it. I thought I was talking on um, this subject, innovation that has nothing to do with tech, optimizing for trust in journalism. The flyer says something a little different. It says, innovation has nothing to do with tech, <laughs> which is not really a defense of the state. <laughs> so, um, uh, what I wanted to talk about was a type of innovation that doesn't have anything to do with it, uh, and that's the, the, the actual uh, title of my talk today. Um, an example of a kind of innovation that has nothing to do with tech um, would be a, a type of innovation that American journalists almost never talk about. In fact, I don't believe they think it even exists. And that would be ideological innovation. When does that ever come on the table in journalism? Um, it doesn't, to my knowledge. Uh, an example would be a very uh, well-known remark by David Weinberger, the internet philosopher from the Berkman Center at Harvard, who said, transparency is the new objectivity. Transparency is the new objectivity, which is a very fruitful idea. My version of that idea is Here's where we're coming from is a lot easier to trust than the view from the other. Here's where we're coming from is easier to trust than the view from nowhere. And an example of a journalist who practices that way would be uh, Glenn Greenwald. He has a very strong point of view. His work also shows very high standards of verification. It's very difficult to catch Glenn Greenwald in an incorrect um, he's extremely opinionated, maybe too opinionated sometimes. 
um, but he also breaks big stories. So he is a journalist who has an MMA practice ideological innovation, but that's a kind of innovation that's never um, recognized. So I'm interested in innovation that has nothing to do with technology. Some other things that I'm very interested in to the point of obsession. So we can talk about these as well. The president's campaign to discredit the American press and its intersection with our politics and our journalism. It's a very important subject that I've written a lot about. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, it's something I talk about almost every day. Um, I'm currently studying membership models in news. Membership as a uh, support system, sustainability method for news sites. Uh, I'm the director of something called the Membership Puzzle Project, which is a grant-funded program to study membership models in news very quickly. Subscription is different than membership. Subscription is you pay your money, you get the product. If you don't pay, you don't get the product. Membership is you join the cause because you believe in the work. One of the implications of that is that um, if you join the cause because you believe in the work, you don't necessarily mind if that work spreads to people who aren't members. And so membership does not apply a paywall where a subscription does, and that's extremely important because after all, the press is supposed to inform the public, the entire public not just the portion that's willing to pay. So membership is, I think, a really important um, possible form of sustaining journalism. And as director of the Membership Puzzle Project, myself and my research director, Emily Dalladoski, who was a former we, we a research person at the New York Times and used to be here at Stanford Design School, um, we are currently studying membership models around the world and around the United States to understand that as a, as a support system for journalism. I'm also very interested in and have been for the, since the beginning of my career in all forms of public participation in the press. My belief that the more people who participate in journalism, the stronger it is. Um, and I've been involved in projects to test that proposition for uh, 30 years. Um, I'm going to touch on all these things tonight in this short presentation, the production of trust in journalism, which is also a Twitter thread, as you see, uh, because I believe that journalism education is something that should be done in public. Um, so it takes about 12 minutes. In a book called Politics and Vision, Philosopher Sheldon Wolin said that when there is vision, things appear in their corrected forms, which explains what I mean by optimizing the trust in journalism. It is a vision towards which we have to move. Trust can no longer be assumed. Its continuous production has to be designed into journalism. Nor does trust any longer follow from industry practice. American journalists used to say that you had credibility if you kept to the rules of good practice. That doesn't work anymore. It doesn't produce trust. Ask me that number. You have to design the modern news organizations so that it is easier for people to trust them which of course doesn't guarantee that they will. We might even say that trust has to become more agile, in the sense of agile programming. We also have to make it easier for people to form a tight relationship with the news sites they value. Otherwise, Facebook, Google, and maybe Apple News now will own that relationship. It was Aaron Pilhofer, uh, of the New York Times and the Guardian, now at Temple University, who sent me in this direction. In 2016, he asked, what would a news organization look like if it were optimized, not for clicks, or for scoops, or for time on site, but for trust? I thought this was a very good question, so I started talking about it on social media. My colleague Emily Bell at Columbia University, also formerly of The Guardian, did not agree with me. 
She said the question was badly framed. In her view, trust was a poor metric for quality journalism. Arguably, she said, Breitbart optimizes for trust. So does the Daily Mail. At first, I didn't understand this objection. Certainly, I didn't particularly trust Breitbart, nor would I think that it was built on trust. And yet, I have to admit, its core supporters did trust it. Breitbart was optimized for them. And so, in a way, it was a site that was optimized for trust. So this may be looking at Emily Bell's dismissal of trust as a poor metric. It's easy to get some people to trust you if you present as news only those things that support their existing beliefs, or if you demonize those they already resent as white part tends to do. So I realized that my image of a newsroom optimized for trust was incomplete. The problem is not how to generate trust by publishing news. In a way, our president does that with his Twitter feed. He offers news of his presidency, and his most committed supporters welcome it, and they buy into it. In fact, there's polling to indicate that Trump is more trusted as a source of information than the news media by Republicans. Among this group, at least his campaign to discredit the American press is worth it. In that particular poll I cite there, uh, Trump is actually more trusted than Fox News as a source of information about the president among Republicans. If by itself trust is a poor metric, then the design problem becomes how to combine high standards of verification with what real journalism requires into optimizing the news organization for trust. The hard part is another way to say it. The hard part is not to stay in business. Teenagers from Macedonia filling up Facebook pages with made up news stories are staying in business. The hard part is to stay in journalism, which means to accept its constraints like did that really happen? And does the public need to know? Now I want to unpack the suitcase I've been carrying around, this phrase, optimizing the trust. Here are some things that are in it. When I can easily understand not only the news story I read when I clicked through to your site, but the data policy I bought into when I signed up for your site, that's optimizing for trust. When I know you'll report it when it's nailed down, and then you'll correct it when it comes apart, that's optimizing for trust. When I can click on your reporter's name and find not only her bio and archive, but where she's coming from and what motivates her, that's optimizing for trust. And I can go to the About tab at your site and learn not only about your mission and ownership, but also about your reporting priorities, what you're spending scarce resources on, and why that's optimizing for trust. When I can feel you getting better at listening to the internet, even as you publish on the internet, when I can add my knowledge to yours to make for a better Product, when my attention is not grabbed, but given, when you as a reporter not only know your stuff, but show your work, when responding to criticism and sorting the valid from the invalid criticism is considered a vital newsroom skill, when educating people with your journalism is joined to educating them about journalism, increasing their literacy about it, how it's normally done, or when reporters share their learning curve, even as readers share their expertise, when the people who value the work elect to support it financially and want it to spread to the public it is made for, when you not only ask supporters for money, but explain how you will use their money. 
When radical transparency combines with genuine diversity to make something better than newsroom objectivity, when all these things start happening together and form their own newsroom culture, then we're beginning to optimize the trust. The past year, I've been working with the Dutch site, the correspondent, the world's most successful member funded news site, as it expands into English language publishing. They have a clear sense of how to continuously produce trust using the membership model. When I look at their design, the things I've been talking about appear in their corrected forms. That's why I'm helping them break into the American market. They have vision in children with insight. Today, the users of journalism, the readers, the listeners, the viewers, the subscribers, the members, have more power. In part because they have more choice, and in part because they are paying more of the costs as the advertising subsidy declines. Because the users of the product have more power, the makers of the product have to listen to them more. Increasingly, the quality of your journalism will depend on the strength of your relationship with the people who use and value your work the most. Optimizing for trust is thus a name for the shift in imagination required if news organizations are to recognize this new balance of power between users and makers. That's my presentation. Now, to answer your question, um, an example of how um, simply following industry practice isn't good enough would be um, the traditional way that um, mainstream journalists try to uh, generate uh, trust is by saying to news users, look, we don't have a point of view, we don't have an agenda, we don't have any assumptions, we don't have a philosophy here. Um, we're just telling you the way it is, so believe it because it's just information. That, is what I call the view from nowhere, is implied in mainstream journalistic practice. Increasingly, however, that claim, we don't have a point of view, we don't have an agenda, we don't have a starting point, we don't have an assumption, we're just having the news, so believe it because it's good information. Increasingly, that kind of claim generates mistrust. The audience doesn't believe it. And if it generates mistrust, then you can't escape from that by insisting ever more on your objectivity. You actually have to adjust. So that's an example where following industry practice doesn't lead to the same result. And I think the predicament that journalists are in now is still with situations like that where their practices are not necessarily having the same result that they have. So, let's talk. Is that because they, as they fail, or because they have been successfully undermined by people like Vladimir Putin in terms of setting up a, yeah. a, 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 a different narrative that undermines the fact that it's the thing, if there is such a I, I still want to believe there is the truth. I share that belief. Um, I share that desire. Um, I think this has happened through a complex series of events where, to some degree, the claim to objectivity in journalism has been abused, has been used in the wrong way, which is not to say there's no such thing as objective truth. I'm not making that point. I don't believe that. But the claim to objectivity, or as I call it, the view from nowhere, has been abused to some degree in professional journalism, and so that's part of the reason. But there's also been an attack on mainstream journalism that has been successful. Um, the campaign to discredit the American press as biased and as um, as the I'll like put it uh, as democratic operatives with press passes, which is a very common phrase uh, on the right, has been to some degree successful. It is very successful with uh, the core supporters of the president, who are likely to tell bolsters, for example, that most of the press is made up, um, either to the end. Um, and so the, the Republican Party is increasingly dependent on 
culture war appeals of this type to mobilize its voters and win elections. And so the political attack on the press has been successful uh, in um, the undermining of that. But journalists have also, in many, in many ways, contributed to that uh, through their own background. So, going back to the Breitbart example, if you ask the followers of the Harris, or the Jones, or the Kiko or something, that's fine, and say they're following a book, a man who's, you know, he's very transparent, tells you where he's coming from, um, and, and it's fine, so forth. And the trust they have in the system, their understanding of this practice, which may actually be made up in some, some sense, so it's just like, you know, I, I can sell you snake oil and tell you it comes from this amazing source that is very effective, it's just the reason why it works. And you believe me because that's kind of the model you've built up. So you can make up models that, you know, do pretty much like what you described, and you can be able to do. But I don't think that'll change the fact that, you know, sort of like right by and informers having hold of people. They do have a hold. And that's not going to change. No. They are exploiting some of this as well, except in their notion, their trust is not built on reality. Right, well, what I tried to say was they have trust, they generate trust through the way they operate in the manner that you suggest. What they don't have is high standards of verification. Uh, and for us to call it journalism and to care about it as journalism, it has to have high standards of verification. So that's the difference. Is so a new source that is trusted is not necessarily journalism. It would be if it meets the two biggest questions that journalists have to answer. Did this really happen? Is it really true? And is it something the public needs to know? So journalism has to be about those things. So it's not enough to be trusted. You also have to have high standards of verification and some sense of the public interest in what we publish. But yes, those sources are trusted because they are um, ideologically believed with their support. Uh, this whole question of trust and belief and, and, and truth, I don't know, I, I feel a little skeptical in my own sense about whether this is really about what's true or not, mm -hmm. so much as what we want to be true. That this is just sort of like it tastes great, let's go in front of our hands where Maybe there's a large group of people who's answered in these polls. I mean, it's not just the press, it's also, you know, probably a few share trusts or whatever to do these polls. And the answer is sort of like, fuck you. You know, it's, it's uh, I believe Trump because I want to believe Trump. Yeah. And it's not really a question of whether they do or do I think it's crazy, really, that, that this would be this sort of person. How do you deal with that when you're, you're sort of, if it's true that we're dealing with not so much belief as motivation, motivated thought, how does developing trust in something like that help with that? Is there a way to, to, to get to that in the sense of what, what we're really doing here? I don't know. It's a very hard question. Um, it's possible that what people mean when they say they trust Trump as a source of news it's not so much that they think what he's saying is true, it's that they're jeering at the news media, or they're jeering at the polls, right? Or, they're, or like you're saying, they're just they're just kind of like exiting. Um, in a really interesting little book, uh, more than 30 years ago, the economist A.O. Hirschman, Albert Hirschman, um, distinguished between exit voice and left. So exit, when people are, here's this period, when people are dissatisfied with the service they're getting, they have three choices, exit, voice, and home. Exit is stop buying the product. Delta Airlines treated me badly, I'm going to exit, I'm not going to use that product. The market is very efficient at exit. It's good enough. Voice is Delta Airlines, you're mistreating me, and I'm going to tell you about what you've done so in hopes that you would fix it. Right? That's voice. Voice is speaking up about what's bothering you. And loyalty is, what can I do? I'm locked into Delta. I've got 300,000 points on them. Right? Or what can I do? I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. I'm going to be a Cubs fan for life, even though this team is terribly mismanaged. That's loyalty. So, uh, so 
So we shift this over to the mainstream press. We've seen exit. A lot of people have exited from the new system, especially the poor supporters, the people we were just talking about. Voice, actually, American journalism has never been very good at this. And that's one of the ways they've contributed to this. Uh, and loyalty, that used to exist. But I think with so many choices in the media universe now, it's very hard to create that except through optimizing for trust, which is why I use that kind of phrase. So that's also involved. The American press has always been very good at helping people identify wet paper. Maybe there's, a, there's one type of there's one type of interaction where you can really get a soft paper. Yeah. Right. You have to you have to be responsive if that product is not that so the question is they could be that responsive. Exactly. Yes. So you framed your talk as um, innovation that is not related to tech, but <laughs> to ask you about technology. That's cool. Um, sure. I guess I'm curious for the objective for optimizing for trust, given the current media landscape that's been enabled by digital technology, are there aspects that make you particularly optimistic or pessimistic about how journalism has changed through emerging technology or through the internet that make you optimistic or pessimistic about the ability to optimize for trust? Like, <laughs> yeah, um, sure. There's. Um, an example would be um, the fact that we aren't locked into a 30-minute broadcast or a, uh, a magazine with a certain number of pages or a newspaper that only has you know, room for uh, five articles a day. The fact that, uh, in a sense, uh, space is, is infinite um, is, is huge because that means we can uh, do all kinds of things we can never do before. You can respond to demands that you couldn't. Um, the fact that the news media is now two way is super important because when people are dissatisfied, when they are close to exit, they can talk to us. So there's a chance for a voice in a way that there never was before. And I think that's super important, super valuable. Um, the fact that we know how people are actually behaving. This news climate could be a, a really important source of data for improving and something. Uh, that's good. Uh, and the fact that uh, the cost of publishing and the cost of trying things, of course, is much lower than it used to be. And so we can learn much more easily if the cost to try is so low. So those are some of the things that I think are good about digital technology. So I guess. I was thinking a similar thing about your point is that we have this capacity to provide access to greater amounts of information and provide deeper access in some cases, which definitely aligns with this idea of, of providing uh, transparency. On the other hand, purely based on my personal perception, it seems like a lot of existing forms of digital information are are aiming towards shorter and shorter engagement and shallower forms of engagement. That's right. So I guess I'm wondering, like, even if we have capacity to provide depth, um, how much the medium actually encourages people to take advantage of that depth. Right. I'm not sure it's the medium so much as, as the way that we develop business models to support digital publishing. Um, that's why I distinguish optimizing for trust from optimizing for attention, or clicks, or time on site. So one of the reasons I'm working with the correspondent in, in the Netherlands is exactly on this point. Um, so they are the world's most successful member funded site. They have 65,000 members who pay 60 euros a year because they believe in the, journal, the kind of journalism that's being done at this site. The kind of journalism they do is in-depth examination of social problems that sometimes take months to complete, and that always include an aspect of what can we do about this? What can I do, for example, in reducing my carbon footprint? What can we do as a society to move on this? So that's their formula. And they, um, 
They don't participate in the daily news cycle. They don't do controversy or debate coverage. There are no ads, uh, no clickbait, no billionaires, no state funding, no foundations, just the members. Uh, and as a result, they don't have to engage in any of these tricks to get people to click and, and to um, glue their eyeballs to the screen. Uh, because the basis of the relationship between the members and the journalists is very different. So, for example, uh, a few years ago there was a terrorist attack in Belgium, in Brussels, that killed quite a few people. There are, 18, there are uh, millions of Dutch speakers in Belgium, so that's part of where the, uh, the correspondence circulates. And the journalists at the correspondent felt initially like, we should do something like this, this is the biggest story of the day. Uh, we have to have something about this. And the editor-in-chief was a little skeptical because uh, the correspondent doesn't have anybody in Brussels. It doesn't have anyone who's particularly um, expert in terrorism. Um, so he said, well, I don't know. What are we going to do that's really going to add value? And the journalists were insistent that something had to be said because we couldn't ignore the biggest story uh, going on. So the editor decided to email all members, all 60,000 members, and say, this happened in Belgium, it's a big story. We don't have anything to add because we don't have anybody there. We'll be back in three days, and here are some news sites that are doing a really good job covering this terrorist attack. And from that email, they got the biggest one-day increase in membership they've ever done. So that's what I mean by a relationship based on trust. They didn't publish because they couldn't add anything, which is part of the contract between the site and its supporters. Because the users of news have more power now, the contract between them and the producers has to change. And that's an example of how it can change. So I, you're right, the way that we have developed digital media has essentially abused the news user's attention. And that has led to a lot, itself has led to a lot of mistrust. And I think the only way we can begin to attack that problem is through mo business models that don't uh, buy and sell people's attention, which is a big test. Yes? I feel like um, for most of the correspondent, where the membership on the um, it, it does a good job at um, telling people, okay, if I don't deliver, you can cancel on me and then subscribe. Uh, and subscribe the next one. But still, um, I feel like, especially in longer investigations, reporters have to kind of deliver constantly a little bit for people to stay on the ball. Mm -hmm. And how do you, so how do you, when you make this first promise, you be back is, how do you initiate that initial trust? I think that's like a different kind of trust than the trust that you have to have in the day. Yes. So, yeah, how do you, do you get people's attention? <laughs> well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how they do it. Um, the correspondent, you follow writers, you don't follow topics or sections. And um, each one of the 21 full-time correspondents, all supported by them, are required to do one thing. They have one requirement. They have to write a weekly email to their followers about what they're working on, how it's going, what knowledge needs they have, what sources they might be looking for, what problems they're running into. And so if you follow uh, the energy correspondent, you're aware of what they're doing, you're aware of what they're struggling with, you kind of understand the progress of their investigation, and you are asked if you have any knowledge that should be part of this public, it is kind of your duty as a member to provide that. Um, and so that's how they get around this need to have something new every day to hold people's attention, is they let you into the process of doing journalism so you uh, know what to expect. I should add also that each of the 21 full-time correspondents uh, is permitted to define their own beat and decide on their own reporting projects, which is very unusual. And in exchange for this extraordinary freedom to define their own beat, 
they are required to spend 30 to 40 percent of their time interacting with the members, which means especially drawing knowledge from them. So in a way, what the correspondent is doing is going directly at a very common complaint people have about the news. You might have experienced this yourself. Is when they write about something I know about, because I was involved in it, they get it wrong. This is like the most common complaint about them in many ways. And the correspondent is trying to teach its members, when we are reporting on something you know about, you have to help us. We need your knowledge, we need your expertise. And they're trying to teach their members that it's okay if you want to comment on our work. We, if you want to express your opinion, you can. But we're not really that interested in your opinion. We are very interested in what you know. And would you please share it with our correspondents when they need it? And so, if you have successfully shared your knowledge and it made its way into one of the correspondent's uh, reports, the chances are that when it comes time for you to renew your membership, you're going to say, yeah, I'm doing something important here. I'm really contributing to this organization. And that's all they need. They don't need daily traffic quotas. They don't need you to uh, buy the sponsor's product. They just need you to renew your membership if they've generated enough trust and confidence over the year. See the difference? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, it's very interesting what you're saying. Uh, I think it does reflect a sort of tech view of journalism. And I, I think, I don't know, I don't want to, okay, I'm going to give you a hard time. Everyone else is. Um, sure. I sort of, in, in, so Anne and I were both at the Wall Street Journal. Which maybe I think some of the time we were there I had the luxury of being sort of apart from the world you're talking about. I, mean, I wasn't chasing clicks, and we were sort of the second newspaper for all rich people. So you know, the best source of tips was just like you're talking about, was the was the readers. You know, whenever I wrote something, a reader would call me up and say, "Well, you missed the real story, which is such and such." Yeah. Just like you're talking about this such publication. So I think it's absolutely right what you're saying, but maybe not not new. Um, not new. No. But I, I think this idea that the the journalists need to optimize for sort of perceivable trust or engendering trust in the reader. It seems to me that any reader that expects that they will be able to judge the believability of a news story directly would be foolish uh, to think that. Um, you know, when we talk about what journalists do, you know, they afflict the comfortable and they comfort the afflicted, or they write the, the first draft of history, or you know, it's a it's a it's an outfit that you give your money to, and then they spend time on your behalf. So you don't have to going in talking to sources sometimes confidentially and beating the ground and you know and, and finding things out. And then you know, this idea that the journalists, you know, pretend to be a view from nowhere, I realize that's sort of your catchphrase, but it, I think it's a bit of a straw man. I mean okay. it's, it's my opinion. But I, I think in fact that what we would say to the Wall Street Journal is that we express our judgment all the time. And, and your you the readers are paying us for that. We decide what's in the what's news column and we decide what's on the front page. And in fact What's on our front page is totally different from what's on the New York Times front page, and that's something we, we decide on, on purpose. Uh, so we are exercising our news judgment, you know, whether we put AIDS on the front page or page A15, or a hurricane on the front page or page A15, we are expressing our judgment about what you, you the reader, should learn every day, and you're paying us to express our opinion uh, like that. It, it seems to me, um, so, it's, so it's not a view from nowhere, it's really like, this is our view, this is what we think it, that you should learn, this is what we spent the last six months going and in, in investigating. And any reader who thinks that, you know, by my showing my work a little bit, that they're going to be able to actually judge whether the story is trustworthy is, I mean, that's just foolish. Uh, to actually figure out if the story is right or trustworthy, you really have to spend, you know, six months on it. Mm. I think the same is true in my scientific work. You know, now that I'm here, when I publish my work, I publish a replication data set. My colleagues don't know if it's true or not. I mean, no one actually replicates the work. Um, you know, it's there so that if someone thinks, you know, maybe I'm a fraud, then you can go back and actually replicate it. But no one actually does that. You would never, if you think about some of the most celebrated stories in journals, you know, Seymour Hersh on the My Lai Massacre, or Jane Mayer's scoops on uh, torture, Dan Golden about universities cheating on their alumni donation figures, or, you know, the New York Times is still warrantless wiretapping by the U.S. government. I mean, none of these things would have been possible for the newspaper to publish anything that would give a rational reader some ability to judge whether the story is true or not. That's just not, not the way it works. So why do we trust me? 
Sorry? So why do people trust me? Well, why do you trust me as a scientist? I mean, so, you the reader don't Oh, wait a minute. In science, in science, there are ways to check. That's the whole idea of science. It's got a public Yeah, but it's really hard. Term. It's really hard. To figure out if the, New York, if the, if the American government is actually warrantlessly wiretapping on people, it's not something an individual reader can judge, no matter how many words you write. you got to actually talk to the real sources. you got to call them up and say, like, are you spying on people without warrants? It's not something that the ordinary reader can judge without putting in the effort that a journalist would have to do. Okay. I think this, the same thing would be true scientifically. Okay. Well, let, let me say this in, in response to that volley of complaints. Um, I think it's true that, that very often reporters have to um, tell us things that not only can we not check up on, um, but they might disturb our work. Uh, they might be highly unpopular. Um, they might even alienate us from them. Uh, and I think that in, because that's in the nature of journalism, people need to have a strong relationship that can withstand the strength of truth telling, which is what you're talking about. And that it can be created when you level with people, when you, where possible, show them your work, when you, when you can, say to them, don't believe me, look for yourself. And it's true that that's not always possible. But my point is, if you do that regularly, then when it's difficult to trust journalists because there's no other source of information, then maybe they will. A better example is anonymous sources. Anonymous sources tell journalists lots of things that are true. But the very form of the anonymous source provides us with almost no help in trusting that source. So on what basis am I going to trust it? Well, if in other practices over time, you have shown that you are a transparent and trustable journalist or source of news. So I, I think there are, what you're saying is in the, in the name is true, that there are all these things that are published, they're very important, that it's hard for us to check up on. And so it requires what I call that strong relationship between readers and writers and users and uh, producers. And if you simply publish stuff that's true without creating that relationship, then what's going to happen is people are going to hear it and they're not going to believe it, which is one third of the public right now is in that stance. One third of the American public right now says, no matter what you say, Wall Street Journal, I don't believe it. Yes. So I subscribe to the New York Times for and Me too. I still get it. I mean, it's best of all worlds. I live in California. I rely on my driveway every morning. And it's amazing, isn't it? It, it is. And um, I tried reading it online, and it's not the same. Uh, there's something about the package yeah. of the newspaper, the product, which I trust. And it, what it's giving me is not just a bunch of individual news stories, but a kind of worldview. Yes. Where you put the whole thing together, not only the news in the front, but the business news and the sports and the arts. It gives you a kind of coherent, and, I, and I, it's very important to me actually to read before I turn on the television and look at my Twitter feed, mm -hmm. because it sort of puts the world together. Mm -hmm. And my sense is, we're going to talk about technology, very hard to replicate that, maybe impossible in an electronic world. It seems like maybe what you're suggesting, and you know, I do, because I'm a regular reader, I understand, you know, like Brett Thrush or Matthew Haberman or James Reston, you know, people who might develop trust in over the time because I've got to recognize their voice and their perspective and risk off and whatever. And it sounds like you're sort of saying that that model of a brain that built up trust over time, because I think it was this coherent physical package, no longer works. And that in the case of Reichbart, it's Reichbart who's being trusted. It's a person, and what you're, it seems to me what you're suggesting that the correspondent is it's a set of individual people that you're replacing institutional trust with personal trust. Is that yeah. right? To an extent, yes. They they are trying to drive the trust transaction downward in the organization so that it primarily revolves around the relationship between you and the other. So they that all is, share 
uh, practices right. and, uh, and a commitment to right. certain things. But ultimately, it sounds like the real core of it is these individual relationships, somebody who you interact with. And all that. Right. Yes. right. That's the building. Yeah. yeah. A couple things come to mind. One, I was thinking before scientists came up, that, that seems to be one maybe model profession where you've got people's track records and their credentials and those are, you know, uh, in every publication. In science, you have to show your work. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, scientists are dealing with the same kind of skepticism, you know, culturally speaking, as everybody else. So, yeah. So there's that. And then I found myself thinking about bylines and how much of the time I spent thinking about the bylines and how mm -hmm. distracting it can be. And how, oh, there's a headline. Oh, it's a Frank Rooney. I don't want to read it. You know, I'm sorry, Frank. Um, but what about publications like The Economist that don't have any violence at all? And actually, yeah. I take a certain sort of comfort in, in not playing that game and just reading this institutional voice that's so uh, purely consistent. Yeah. Um, what if we went the other direction? Right? We didn't spend so much time like arbitraging over which reporter voice is the good voice. What do I know about that? I'm not an insider. I know yeah. Stuff. You know, it's funny because I've gotten this question about The Economist like three times in the last few months. Uh, but it's true what you said about it. The Economist is a very unique, uh, very unique, very um, stylized thing. Um, extremely difficult to uh, replicate. We know that because um, during the several decades it took for Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report to essentially lose their market and lose their way, which they all have, um, each one of them at different times in their evolution uh, pledged that they were going to become more like the economist, which, which was their formula for how to survive. And none of them ever did. Um, and there's, I think, several reasons for that. The economist has, uh, first of all, it has a point of view. The, the economist believes in global capitalism, it believes in free markets, it also believes that there's a big role for government in like setting the, the terms of those markets. It has, it has like a, a sort of tightly woven set of beliefs that everybody who works for the correspondent shares. Um, it also has a shared voice that is a huge part of the appeal of that publication, which is cre uh, created through intense editing and also in intense internal culture that is like incredibly strong so that people can come in and out of it and the economist remains the same. You can, you can switch out the entire staff with a new staff over a period of 10 to 15 years, and it would still be the economist. And it's just really rare for such a thing to exist, and it's been proven very difficult for others to imitate it. And so, yeah, in that case, the institutional voice of that publication is successful, and they have been successful in making the transition to a digital era. But it's very hard to find another thing like it. I love the ideas about membership and transparency, but I wonder and not how to use the economy. Because you, the reason you could run these stories from anonymous sources or things that couldn't be instantly verified is because you know the Wall Street Journal couldn't afford to get it wrong. Because eventually the truth comes out and it's turned out and they made up the story by consequences. Right? Now, increasingly, controversies become difficult. I mean, uh, I think info wars. It's still running this thing about yeah. you know, how, you know, how those, the massacres did not happen or whatever, and pizza gate and whatnot, but there's no way to enforce that. Right? Yeah. Um, so, has something fundamentally changed? And is there, do you think there might be solutions for this? Maybe some of them technical solutions? I don't know any technical solutions to that. You're right. Accountability for being wrong is a lot weaker than it used to be. Uh, and it's much easier to publish stuff that is completely untrue and even concocted. Uh, in the membership model that I talked about in the correspondent, the accountability comes through the fact that everybody who has one of these very desirable jobs as a correspondent, which is right now is like the most desirable position in Dutch journalism because you have so much freedom. Uh, everybody knows that the source for their paycheck is the members. There's no other source. It's not the advertisers, there's no sugar daddy, <laughs> there's no foundation, there's no billionaire. And so since you know it's the members that are supporting you and you hopefully like your job, you're accountable to them. Uh, 
Now, I'm not saying that works for everything. It's not, a, it's not like a solution to this problem. I'm not saying that at all. But that's how they, they do it. But yes, I think we we are in a way that in a crisis of accountability because anybody <coughs> can publish any damn thing they want on the internet and nobody can tell them they can't. That's a fact of life. In the absence of accountability, if engagement is driven by how salacious the title is or whatever the story is, then then there's no solution because people can make up stuff all the way. Because it's easier to make up stuff than actually record. That's a good description of one of the prices, right? So I'm not, I'm not giving a solution to that. Well, I can't give you a solution that doesn't exist. <laughs> but in that case, that part of the pie is going to keep growing. Yeah. So what do we do? Right now, we have no idea. We're engaged in a vast, uh, uncontrolled experiment to find out if we can still have a democracy when that fact happens to be true. Nobody knows what to do about that. Um, now, it's possible that we're in some sort of cycle, political cycle, where this will like burn itself out because people will see how limited that is. We don't know. One of the things to watch for in 2018, one of the things I will be watching for, is how many Republican candidates beyond Trump change their own political appeal so that they are, for example, running on hatred of the news media as a campaign strategy. Do they adopt that? Uh, or do they sort of let him have that? We don't know yet. It's possible they will. If they don't, that's a sign. If they do, that's a different sign. So we don't know. We're, as I said, we're in the middle of an uncontrolled experiment, but it's not just attacks on the press. As, as you mentioned, it's also skepticism about science. It's a disrespect and put down of expertise in, for example, our State Department. It's uh, unpublishing scientific information in EPA and uh, NASA. It's kind of like a revolt against expertise and verification in all of its forms. That is a form of politics, a cult it's a cultural form of politics. Will that continue to rise, or will it become self-defeating and sort of peter out? We don't know. But the answer to that question is extremely important for the future of China. Yes? Um, it seems like most of the conversation has been focused on national and international reporting. And I'm wondering about, I'm wondering how this would apply on, on the local level, since that seems to be suffering a much greater crisis right now. Yeah, um, especially when we look at what happened in Denver and what's happened in Salt Lake City and all those places. So, yeah, is it is is it possible to optimize the trust? Is it easier to do it locally, considering the smaller footprint? Is it harder to do it? Well, um, local is the biggest the biggest problem in journalism, as you know. Um, that's where the the biggest losses in uh, reporter power uh, have been seen. Um, that's where uh, the biggest um, uh, crisis in business model is seen. Uh, and so the, the digital upstarts that have tried to kind of move in and, and take up some of the slack from the declining Metro Dailies have, for the most part, had a very difficult time of it and aren't even close to replicating what's been lost. And uh, I hate to put it this way, but right now there's no, there, nobody has a solution to that. That's, it's an unsolved problem in journalism. It's been that way for 15 years. There's nothing on the horizon that's done so, as far as I can see. That's one reason people are so, in journalism, are so frustrated with Facebook, is that it doesn't seem to care about that loss, even though it makes noises, which it recently has, about supporting local news. So, uh, Possibly, um, membership organizations at the local level could work, except that the number of people who are willing to become members of these sites is like 1% of the readership. Um, on a, in a national or international scope, that can work. At a, the local level, it's ultimately it ends up not being enough money to actually support the number of journalists who need to inform the other 99%. So, I don't have an answer to that. I'm very aware of it. I don't think anybody does have an answer to it. Uh, and right now we're caught in a spiral where um, the owners of these properties have the legal right to essentially run them into the ground 
which is what they're doing, harvesting is, is an industry term for it. Uh, and the only thing that could possibly stop them would be sort of like um, community pressure. Uh, but it's, uh, it's extremely unlikely that something like this would have happened. For example, in Denver, which is a situation I'm following like many other people, in Denver, the only way really to wrest control of that property from the uh, hedge fund that is currently destroyed would be if the mayor and civic leaders somehow were able to organize a boycott among the advertisers so that the property became essentially worse. worse. But that's like boycotting the paper to save it. Like, what are the chances that that's actually going to work? Very hard to imagine. But right now, that's like the only thing that could possibly do it. And anything that's moving from, from the digital world to replace this declining institution and I know a few sites like that, like Denverite, which is a new one, are tiny. We're talking about three, three reporters. I've been there. I've visited them. They're, they're struggling. They're doing a good job, but three reporters. <laughs> so it's just like really hard. You're giving me these unsolvable problems. You're doing that on purpose. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry to arrive there. I can jump in here with some knowledge. Okay. I was on something called Patch. Yes, I know. Yes. And um, my experience, what you're talking about. Um, and my, my question or my going forward, since all I can do is throw up my hands right now, is the same. Maybe we're putting a capital J on journalism, mm -hmm. it should be a lowercase j. And if everybody can, in fact, be a publisher, maybe what journalism has to be is more like basketball. Where you know there are people who are going to play tonight and get tens of millions of dollars, I guess, right? There's a play on that, and they're going to play at one level, and maybe they will be big J journalists. But maybe as educators on the inside, what we need to do is we need to educate everybody. It needs to be an English. And by the way, you don't make stuff up, and you probably shouldn't quote people who don't have a name. And in other words, make journalism one of the three R's. I think we have to change it. We have the three R's and the J. But we're not going to defeat the technology. We're only going to get people to say, you know something, there are some rules we should all follow. Even me, when I'm posting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is plausible to try and raise literacy about media practices, about journalism, and to teach people, for example, maybe it's not a good idea to pass on stuff that they haven't been able to verify that. I think that's plausible to be difficult, but plausible. But I, I don't think it's plausible to expect citizen publishers to do the kind of digging and reporting that you were talking about. That's not, that's not going to happen. No. People aren't going to go out and their, use their evenings to go report on events in the community and tell the rest of the community about them. That, that is an unrealistic proposition. And I'm somebody who's written about so-called citizen journalism. I, I, it's something that I, I am not hostile to in any way, but I don't see that as a solution to the problem of the, these declining assets in which you don't have local reporters reporting on the community anymore because there's no business model to support them. Citizen journalism is not the kind of answer. I, I completely agree, but uh, I asked you to go back and look at the golden days. How golden were they? Well, and if we look at the packaged paper that you look at, very often what I did with my Sunday paper was I went to the funnies. And, sure. you know, I'm sorry, I was just relaxing on Sunday morning. Yeah. And, and, and so 90 for the news. Pardon? That's what paid for the news. Right, and 90% of, of what I got out of it was just like, oh, I'm going to kill the time today. And then maybe 1% once a week would be a really great story that I could way through and would motivate action. So maybe the good old days weren't as good as we think, and, and, and somehow we can muddle through it. I don't know. Well, I didn't use the, the phrase the golden age of the good old days, but yeah. I, I, I'm in sympathy with that. That point, and in many ways, the service provided by the traditional daily newspaper was not all that great of a service. If, for example, you were interested in, um, let's say, you're a reader of the, the Weekend New York Times and you were interested in chess, really interested, 
a weekly chess column doesn't really do a lot of good for you. Right? Um, and so the omnibus newspaper product, in which there's a little bit of everything, was actually not very satisfying to people who had real interest in this thing. The internet publishing was much better than that. Uh, and so good old days weren't that great, but they, did, they were, in one sense, they supported more journalists on the beat telling us about what was going on. That was important. One last question. Um, so the correspondent is taken on in the network, which is a small, arguably homogeneous society. Yes. How um, <coughs> you're optimistic that it's going to roll out here? I wouldn't say that. It's going to work here. Um, I mean, know. now you've got a million dollars yeah. today. Congratulations from the right. state of New York, but how's it going to work? Well, we're taking it one step at a time. So the first thing we had to do was try and uh, raise the money we needed to start the membership campaign in the U.S. And we've pretty much done that. Um, and we, um, we are starting our ambassador campaign, which is f finding people with networks of their own who understand the principles of the correspondent and want to see something like that tried in, in the United States. So we're, we're beginning to sign up those people and we only make a very good start on that. Um, we're, we're also taking the principles as they were articulated in the Netherlands and revising them and changing them and adding to them and subtracting from them so that they speak to the cultural context that we're in. And we're making certain progress uh, in that. Um, and we're starting to figure out what the campaign, the membership campaign here, it's a campaign sort of like a political campaign, sort of like a fundraising campaign, sort of like a social awareness campaign, all three has elements of all three. Um, we're beginning to figure out what the um, uh, sort of the baseline of that campaign is, and we now have a firm to help us do that where we can pay. We run digital campaigns in the past. Um, so we're making progress there. But even with all of those things, I would put odds of success at around 40% right now. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult. And so to go back to the question of local, you're rolling this out nationally. You're not starting in Correct. Colorado. Right. Yes. Should you start in Colorado? People have suggested that. Um, we're not going in that direction, but um, it's possible that member-funded global journalism can emerge. Part of the reason I'm doing this project, part of the reason I'm working with uh, the correspondent, is to see if membership is a way to revive local journalism. It's possible that membership plus newsletter, which is a very promising form because it's, it's, it's so easy to produce, um, could be a combination that works. We don't know, but we're, we're going to give it our best shot. Um, I think it's going to be hard. You know? if we, if we're making anything work digitally, in digital publishing, and with some business model for sustainability is really hard. I don't know anybody who's like breezing through it now. Uh, and a lot of the sites that have attracted a lot of attention have been supported by venture money, as, as you guys know. And they're not necessarily proving the viability of the business model. They're proving that you can get that venture money and spend it. So it is a very challenging thing to create a sustainable new market It's one of the hardest problems in general. Thank you very much.